Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, Galaxy community. My name is Sam Kim, and I work as a product lead at the uh, Center for Infectious Control uh, Genomics and One Health at San Jose University. Nice to meet you. Um, I had a whole lot of uh, personal uh, struggle trying to make out here uh, leading up to this conference. I was diagnosed with uh, stage three cancer. Uh, while I was actually preparing for this presentation. So chemo and radiation and so on, it was no fun at all, but I'm uh, very glad uh, to be here and I'd like to thank the organizers for accommodating me. I um, I do see a lot of joy though in accepting and uh, allowing myself to be and then finding uh, strength uh, to do what I feel passionate about, which is what, why I'm here. I have a DevOps topic. Uh, to speak to you about. I believe that as researchers developing tools, especially in healthcare, it's important for us to understand the production environment and the requirements uh, to be used in healthcare. So uh, due to my illness, I wasn't sure if I could make it today. So my uh, co-presenter and I put together a little recording. So my presentation is a joint set with uh, with the uh, solutions architect Reznal from AWS with the joint presentation. Unfortunately, he won't be here. Uh, he's stuck on a flight. Uh, but if there are questions that have come up, then I'll be sure to relay those and then get the questions answered for you. There's also a Slack channel as well. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank my 13-year-old son to help me prepare for this uh, recording through his magic of video editing. So, Hawk, if you're watching this, thank you so much, and I love you. Um, without further ado, I'll uh, uh, play the recording, and I'll do a little bit of a uh, live Q&A at the end.
My name is Soyeon Kim. I'm the product lead at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health at Simon Fraser University. Today, I'll be sharing information related to DevOps, particularly regarding secure deployment of Galaxy workflow. I'll also share our experience of what it takes to deploy uh, modern tools within a Canadian setting, Canadian healthcare setting. Up until recently, I was managing multiple IT teams within hospitals. I've experienced firsthand how challenging deployment can be in healthcare. Even with a well-tested research software, there are a number of barriers and issues when it comes to deployment. I refer to these as being akin to last mile delivery problems. I'll disclose our story of working together with stakeholders to overcome these last mile problems for Galaxy deployment. My key message is about the primary importance of laying the groundwork for partnership in order to benefit from the multiple perspectives and requirements within public health organizations, as well as externally at partner organizations such as AWS. The perspectives of partners prevent extensive refactoring efforts and enable our team to get the job done right the first time. Our capacity and understanding as a research team increase as a direct result. On a personal note, I was diagnosed with the cancer while I was preparing for this presentation, which only served to increase my belief in solutions available uh, through the open community of Galaxy, which can improve patient outcome, perhaps even mine. I'm delighted to be given an opportunity to connect with you today, and I'd like to thank the organizers for accommodating me. I'd like to acknowledge the folks I work with at the Center for Infectious Disease Genomics and One Health um, at Simon Fraser University. We're primarily a bioinformatics lab. We provide end-to-end -end services, including sample preparation, sequencing, and analysis. We are a development shop uh, comprised of software engineer, microbiologist, and bioinformaticians. I would also like to acknowledge uh, Kenny, June, and Nolan at uh, the teams at AWS, as well as uh, Public Health Agency of Canada. Our mission is to solve real-world infectious disease challenges through One Health lens using advanced computational approaches innovative knowledge engineering, as well as shareholder engagement. Regarding our mission, I would like to begin by uh, sharing a story. We approached healthcare IT and said, hey, we have this tool called IRITA, a rapid infection public health genomics. What do you think? This is what they said. Was a comprehensive architecture review completed? Was the pool, how was the tool vetted and uh, tested? Was there a security threat assessment or a privacy impact analysis? These refer to the uh, specific mechanism, uh, compliance mechanism uh, used in uh, BC Canada. Is it compatible with cloud? In British Columbia, regional health authority and government ministry offer pre-configured cloud environments they have a heavily weighted uh, preference to host all new projects within that environment, especially big data project. They have an existing architecture which allows execution of a shared responsibility model between central IT and application owners, leveraging a number of cloud native services and controls. Who are you going to trust? It's all about lack of trust. Many have asked who built that tool, how many people and your team had access to the code, how big was your dev team? Also, who will maintain the code base in the long run? We all understand that highly trained workforce can be transient given the market demand. And thinking about in the long term, we researchers are sometimes, perhaps often, focused on initial development and are susceptible to some fever, racing to get the code into production, but lacking perspectives on and appropriate considerations for long-term operational requirements. 
One example could be adequately preparing for incident management and user monitoring. Some aspects of incident management are related to who does what, the roles of app the tool itself, such as system health monitoring. Another example is infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code not only guarantees reproducibility, but also in the case of a cyber incident, infrastructure as code provides the ability to treat the incident within the virtual blast radius, a critical advantage. The question remains, can we embed best practices and long-term operational considerations as part of our development process in order to promote ease of use for public health organization? After receiving feedback from partners and other stakeholders, our team came up with a game plan. This is a high-level summary of our process flow to de-risk Right. We use an AWS environment for product development. However, we use academic clusters, academic cloud, and clusters for ad hoc analysis. First, we conduct an architecture review with uh, counterpart AWS teams, as well as our regional health authority partners. Second, we review, collate, and contact, concatenate various Canadian compliance requirements. These requirements include a Canadian federal PBMM protected, which stands for protected B, medium integrity, and medium availability. In addition to a thorough review of privacy schedules and review of best practices, such as the AWS Secure Environment Accelerator, ASEA. Third, we identified gaps between what we have and what we need. Adding services and features to the existing stack in a modular fashion. We did not create the infrastructure of code template from scratch. Where's the fun in that? We use a tool called Former2 in order to automate Terraform code generations. This will be covered in more detail in the presentation by my colleague, Reginald, at AWS. Fourth, security, security, security. Penetration testing security threat assessment, and privacy impact assessment. The result of these efforts typically produced a list of remediations before code is released. We recognize that this is critical to have the ability to iterate and update unfractured code as efficiently as possible. Delays in doing so could cost lives. Again, I cannot emphasize enough how important the feedback process is and how that input needs to be incorporated directly into the DevOps workflow. Compliance requirements are thereby embedded as part of infrastructure as code. I'm going to hand over the presentation to my colleague from AWS, Reginald, to address the architecture itself, our findings before and after the review process, and how we implemented those recommendations. Reginald? Hello, Galaxy Community Conference. My name is Reginald Johnson. I'm a senior solution architect with Amazon Web Services. I've been in the technology industry for the better part of the past 20 years, spending a bit more than half of it working with NGOs and nonprofit organizations, as well as public cloud supporting a variety of scenarios, including public health and research. Right now, I work for AWS as part of a team helping nonprofit entities and healthcare organizations leverage public cloud to support their missions. I was asked by the SIGDO team to identify how Irida can run, be run in AWS using infrastructure as code to deploy as scale. With a diagram that you see on the right, we identified a number of architectural issues. One key issue is perimeter security necessary to meet certain compliance requirements. Anywhere you deploy an application that will be collecting or processing health data, there will be a number of security or compliance requirements that need to be met. This is especially true for the perimeter, but often extends to the interior of the workload itself. Perimeter security controls will be the simplest to meet. Many of these controls are enabled by default by AWS, and additional controls can be added to the environment as it's deployed and after it's deployed. These controls can include encryption for data in transit and at rest, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, 
and protection from DDoS or distributed denial of service attacks. One way that we're able to optimize this architecture, provide greater availability and mitigate security concerns is to decouple the Galaxy workflows into their own pods on the cluster managed by Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. If you're not already familiar with the Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service or EKS, this provides a fully managed control plane for Kubernetes environments on AWS. Think Kubernetes on autopilot, where you're only responsible for managing the underlying nodes if you choose to manage them, and none of the control plane. All of that is completely managed for you. Moving things to separate pods is gonna enable us to not only secure portions of the workload, and its workflows, but also scale those portions as necessary independently of one another. This will enable us to mitigate the concern of compute node idling. How do we know if what we're provisioning is not only sufficient for the workload, but not oversized so that we can prevent resources from running idle, incurring cost, or otherwise not existing in an optimized state? To address this, we're going to have to balance not only the availability of the workload, but also bursty or unpredictable usage patterns. Once the workloads are decoupled to separate pods, it does make it easier to provision and scale resources against the usage patterns of the pod. Because each pattern, each pod is separate and may have separate usage patterns, we can scale one portion of the application without necessarily needing to scale the other, reducing the amount of underutilized resources. Additionally, we're gonna implement and enforce encryption in transit and at rest for parts of the workload, such as communication with Amazon RDS Postgres, and Amazon EFS, as well as a key problem in a workload, which is going to be Docker Hub rate limiting. As we are using Docker containers as part of the managed DKS cluster, we're going to encounter rate limiting with Docker Hub in any case where there is either not a subscription in place or a subscription impacted by rate limiting. As the number of pulls from Docker Hub increases, latency on the workload, applications, and specific jobs is going to be impacted. This is also going to impact deployment flexibility. Now, as we look at the refactor architecture, we're gonna see a number of things that changed for this particular deployment. The first thing we mitigated would be the further decoupling of the Galaxy workflows into separate pods in EKS. From this perspective, the pods are separated for Irida, Galaxy, and BioContainers. Again, this is going to allow us to scale each part of the workload independently of each other and handle compute node idling problem. Each pod can be provisioned with the underlying compute capacity it requires, allowing us to mix and apply both persistent compute on Amazon EC2 and serverless compute using AWS Fargate where necessary without over-provisioning resources anywhere. For encryption in transit and at rest, we're able to leverage AWS Key Management Service or KMS to manage not only the security keys for at-rest disk encryption and object encryption, but also manage the TLS certificates that would be used for encryption in transit. This is used by the EFS share used by all containers in the workload, but also the underlying storage for RDS. KMS will also manage the TLS certificates and associated keys supporting encryption in transit for the connections to RDS and EFS. It's also going to manage the certificates presented by the application load balancer, which for EKS can be implemented as an ingress controller. If we need to manage other pieces of secure data, that can also be offloaded to KMS for secure key storage. We've implemented AWS WAF at the perimeter to protect ingress from outside the application and outside the workload. AWS WAF will integrate directly with the application load balancer or ALB to block malicious traffic before it can be processed by the ALB, reducing load on the ALB itself as well as the underlying workload. AWS Shield is enabled by default, providing always-on and managed layer 4 DDoS protection for inline network attacks. With AWS WAF and AWS Shield both enabled and configured, the workload is going to be protected from layer 4 network attacks, as well as layer 7 application side attacks. Now, onto the Docker Hub rate limiting problem. We're able to address this concern using Amazon Elastic Container Repository, or ECR. ECR is a managed container repository service with a feature known as pull through cache. This will allow ECR to cache a copy of Docker images held in a third party repository, accelerating your ability to deploy them in EKS. ECR will also check the source repository for updates and cache those as well, keeping both its cache and your application and workload up to date on every pull. Now, 
With Docker Hub, you're going to experience rate limiting on the first pull and every subsequent pull. When pulling from ECR, the rate limit you would otherwise experience when scaling your pods no longer applies. That said, there will be a number of next steps that we have to look at in terms of this architecture. A lot of these are going to come down to how you reuse this architecture, manage your workload, and what direction you choose. A primary concern is going to be the sizing of persistent compute. This comes down to your specific workload and how busy it may be. When you deploy these workloads, you may need some persistent compute that is going to impact the availability of various parts of the workload. For anything control plane that doesn't need to scale, you may choose persistent compute to maintain availability and use serverless elsewhere for more ephemeral parts of the workload. What you choose will impact your spin-up time and your availability. Larger resources may require more time to spin up, and that will vary based on your usage patterns and how consistent they are. Another concern will be moving to object storage for data and execution. Right now, as designed, the Galaxy workflow will require using local or network attached storage such as EFS. Using Amazon S3 for object storage will allow you to reduce cost per gigabyte and scale as necessary for working set data during execution. But this is going to require some changes to Galaxy in order to enable that. Another item to address would be replication within and across regions. How available or fault tolerant does your workload need to be? This is going to be inherently supported by EFS, RDS, S3, and EKS. How you choose to implement is going to vary based on your requirements and your need for disaster recovery. Increasing availability for EFS and RDS can be done in a matter of minutes simply by enabling multi-AZ on RDS. For EFS, multi-AZ is enabled by default and the same for the EKS control plane. However, you define the availability of your pods and the underlying worker nodes. So if you need those to be highly available, fault tolerant, or provide for disaster recovery, that is something you have to plan for when you are ultimately designing the EKS cluster or scaling that cluster. You ultimately define how you want your workload to be replicated. Implementing this architecture in EKS is going to allow the components of the workload itself to be incredibly portable. You have the ability to replicate RDS across availability zones and across regions, as well as the EFS share and ECR repository used, whether that is using the replication features of the platform or simply using AWS backup to back up a copy of your data and then restore it to another region. Spinning up a new EKS cluster in another region can then be done in a matter of minutes. Now, how portable is this? AWS provides a feature to EKS called EKS Anywhere which allows you to deploy an EKS cluster using any hardware and environment you choose. So if you have a requirement to use hardware on-premise or a private cloud environment, you have the ability to deploy an EKS cluster, connect it to AWS, and maintain a consistent control plane across your deployments. And any AWS service needed by the cluster can easily be consumed over VPN, allowing you to use the same features available to you if the cluster were running in AWS. Finally, we have to review local compliance requirements for security and privacy. There are ever-changing requirements for security, privacy, and various guardrails that would need to be applied to this or many other architectures. Through this review, we were able to apply a common set of controls. As the number or set of controls increases or is otherwise modified, we will be able to implement the additional controls at the perimeter, as well as the interior of the workload and its subsequent applications. This is a key benefit of infrastructure as code. Everything in this deployment has been distilled to a template that can be easily redeployed in any AWS availability zone or region. As new requirements are added, we can enable those requirements either by updating the infrastructure as code and redeploying or making the change imperatively via the console. You're going to make these changes. Time is going to pass. How do we integrate changes to the infrastructure's code template as time goes on and maintain things like version control, consistency, or simple auditing? How do we maintain the ability to redeploy? If you're not familiar with updating the infrastructure's code template, encounter difficulties doing so, or need some help, there are a few options. There are tools such as Former 2 that will allow you to ingest your existing deployment and output a template. That template can easily be redeployed using CloudFormation. It can be redeployed using Terraform. 
comparing this new template to your previous one is as simple as doing a diff in your tool of choice. If you're using Git, you'll be able to see the changes as soon as you commit or push and revert accordingly. Now, what Former 2 is? Former 2 is an open source and freely available tool allowing you to ingest the components of your existing environment and export to a template that you can use to redeploy or modify as needed. What Former 2 is not? It is not going to grab the details from your non-AWS environments. It is not a part of your CICD pipeline and it is not going to generate Kubernetes Helm charts for you. It is a tool to help you map your existing architecture and easily redeploy to AWS using CloudFormation, using Terraform, or using your tool of choice. This is going to enable you to build a practice around capacity building. So Ian? This collaborative exercise led to capacity building and investment in our own informatics infrastructure. For example, we're streamlining our CICD pipeline to de-risk last mile problems and to increase our ability as a development shop to iterate quickly for real world deployment in healthcare. I'm sharing two different architectures we're working on, one with the GitHub Action together with infrastructure's code, such as Terraform and CloudFormation. The other one is using code pipeline in AWS. If you're a development shop or bioinformatics lab like us, these items should especially resonate. Our informatics infrastructure reflects the reality of working with multiple partners and environment, as well as security and uh, privacy best practices. I'm highlighting some of the key areas such as working with multi-cloud environment, partnership and role separations as part of security best practices. With that, I'd like to close our presentation and open up for questions. The source code is publicly available in the following link. I encourage people to reach out and connect. You can find my contact information in this slide. Thank you. Can you Zoom people hear me? Testing, testing, testing. Testing. Awesome. Okay, I don't think we have time for questions. I'm going to kind of steamroll through, but I think everyone here can join me in the, just the amount of respect for you coming here after that diagnosis. That's so devastating. Let's. Just give a round of applause. All right, so let's uh let's move on. Uh, Luke Sargent is going to be up next. I'm going to make sure we have our top line up. I swear, I feel like three years of using Zoom, you think you don't need access to this thing. It still seems to. Okay, Zoom people, can you see this presentation? Awesome. All right. Luke Sargent is going to talk about scaling Galaxy on the cloud, particularly data local cancer analytics on all apps. Go for it. Hello. I am indeed Luke, and that is indeed the title of my presentation. So, Uh, so our lab does multiplex tissue imaging analysis in Galaxy. Uh, what you see on the right is not a lot of Technicolor CNORs, but is actually viable uh, scientific data. And if you want more inf uh, information on that, I suggest you go to the talk on Wednesday, a Galaxy platform for multiplex tissue imaging analysis in cancer research and translation that uh, Cameron is going to give because he will get into the nitty gritty. Uh, I'm 
I'm going to focus more on the infrastructural gist, which is that uh, we have a set of workflows that have these containerized tools that operate on fairly large data that's fairly computational intensive. So uh, we have some constraints we have to deal with, as do we all, in that uh, the key data sets live on AWS and these requester based buckets, uh, and it's compute storage intensive to analyze them. Uh, and accessibility is also important for collaboration with external folks. And none of this is free. So uh, a naive approach might be to say, okay, what is the BTS to Galaxy instance I can create on a large machine? And I'll just clone Galaxy, I'll set up the Docker runner, download what I need, press the change, go, good to go. Except uh, you're sort of constrained by the most demanding tool that you have. So you're going to have this monolith that runs at your uh, those high specs and you're going to be incurring this cost for something that might be sort of streaky. And then what happens if you run multiple invocations of this tool? So you're in thrall to the most that you're willing to support at one time, uh, i.e. no scalability. You can use infrastructural resources like HPC, um, and we indeed do that. However, one of the downsides of that is that it's less accessible to external collaborators. So, uh, and you don't have quite as much control over what you're deploying. You have the limits that you have to work within. And so it's often cheaper or free to the lab to use, but comes with those downsides and is subject to uh, congestion or what have you. So we decided to go to a, a data local approach to go all in with AWS to compute around the buckets of stuff. And so it's obviously scalable. That's sort of their shtick, the whole cloud thing. And you can throw as much resource as you want at something. Um, it's as accessible as you want to make it. It's uh, much more customizable than say the restrictions that your local institution might impose on your computational resources. And critically, the intra cloud transfer is free, and that's pretty good. The rest of it's not, of course, and that's a bummer. And there were not job runners available initially for the services that we wanted to target, namely batch and CS. So, at a high level, this is uh, the architectural details. I've included a glossary to the right that I'm not going to read. Because <coughs> As much as everyone loves acronyms, I think we get enough of them in our life, but for those who want to look at it offline, how about it? But uh, we have a, a head node that runs Galaxy and whatever associated services, the IP proxy, and et cetera. Uh, and the key to all of this is the EFS drive, the Elastic File System drive, that is a, a networks file system that can be shared across various computational resources. So we send jobs on demand to either EC2 or Fargate, depending. So Fargate, the serverless container runtime gets little baby jobs and the beefier jobs go to the EC2. And we can use those containerized tools. Uh, so that's sort of similar to some of the Galaxy Kubernetes setups that some might be familiar with. So like uh, Anvil also uses a shared network file system. Uh, and this is a visual representation of the architecture. So in the cloudy box is AWS at large, and then we operate in a single subnet, so we don't replicate across uh, stuff to save on costs. We have our Galaxy instance on the bottom left within EC2, running on a, a constant dedicated VM. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, we either send it to Fargate at the top right or another EC2 instance for the larger things for containerized tools. And all of this is backed by the EFS drive. Uh, so within the cloud, we can transfer around. And of course, to the right, represented by the kitty cat, is the greater internet at large. So we can pull data from the internet, and that's free. We can pull data from the buckets, and that's free. And it's about the end of freebies. Uh, we submit jobs to Fargate or EC2, as I mentioned. The, uh, the runners that we created, uh, just create a template and submit it via Boto through, I don't know if that's the same thing. Uh, and backing it all is the EFS drive. So we have this EFS drive that is mounted into any critical place. And so file changes in one are reproduced in others. We'll look at the glass half full component of cost. 
The intercloud transfer is free. That's good. Ingress is free. We like that. You get a free VDLS, you know, some other small things like a free VDLS IP or a static IP for your domain name, some ephemeral storage should you need it for your Fargate instances, and 100 gigabytes uh, transfer out, which is not nothing. So the takeaway from this, I'm not going to read a whole bunch of numbers, but the main components of the cost, uh, probably starting from most egregious to least, would be the tool runtime, then the EFS drive, and the head node runtime, and then there are other various things. Um, so for our particular instance that we run on US West 2, because that's where we happen to be for Oregon chauvinists, is this. You have a, a constant uptime EC2 instance that we even might be over provisioning and we don't spend, uh, we don't use the reserved instances. That's a, a tweak we'll add as it's good savings, but right now we just pay a flat fee because of reasons. Uh, a little ephemeral storage. And then right now we're sitting at around three terabytes, which is pretty light for a, a large server. I understand um, as we grow, this number will change, uh, but we'll probably have to get a little more aggressive with data retention policies. Uh, and key to this figure, if you're dealing with uh, EFS costs is the ratio of hot to cold storage. So you have uh, cheaper storage that's slower. And so you move from one to the other and the price that they cite is like one to four, but we find in practice that most of the data just sort of sits there and actively work on things are um, somewhat rareish. So we get like a closer to one to eight ratio. But uh, below that you see that the tool uh, invocation costs can vary quite a lot. So it can be cheap for the little baby guys. It can be quite expensive for the beefier half terabyte RAM uh, machines, which is usually, yeah. Um, so to speed this up, this is roughly um, the, we did a rough cost analysis and the dots represent um, the cost of just the tool runtime, on whatever the small scalable instance is, a uh, month of S3 storage and then EFS over the job runtime versus just pure ingress cost, which is the line. And by and large, minus that one first of my outlier seems to be more or less worth it. Uh, in the future, we will use spot instance more. That's something we're just starting to roll out dynamic estimations to make sure that we are more closely tailored to the resource requirements of each individual tool instead of over provisioning, which is a big cost to sync that preserved head known for a data looks cool, but that's a question mark. Understand super well and um, integration with external data comments so that you can utilize your permissions, whatever you have access to. You can look at it by actually going to cancer.usegalaxy.org. Um, try not to be too malicious if you don't mind, but have a look. See, uh, we have a runner that is being worked on to be added into the Galaxy proper, <laughs> and that requires a little bit of infrastructural setup as it won't just work purely out of the box. But we have Ansible rolled into development for that. These are the people I worked with. This is where it would happen in the presentation. Right. <laughs> Sweet. I know. All right, guys, due to hunger reasons, we're going to skip Q&A until lunch. So if you have questions, keep them in your head. All right, so moving on, uh, NS Afghan is going to talk about open bio reference data catalog for Galaxy and bio Take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, yes, so um, jumping right in. Um, so we talk often about uh, reference data anchor everybody in the same place. Uh, where does reference data come from? Well, not where does it come from? Where do you actually see it in Galaxy? And it's that little drop down on some of the tools, such as mappers. Um, and, and you have this long list of, uh, of a few hundred uh, entries. And so the question is, what does that data, data actually reside? Where does it come from? And today, that's on the uh, CDMFS, as we uh, refer to it in, in the Galaxy world with the uh, CERN original uh, machine file system, which is a read only, in our case, locally replicated um, uh, file system that hosts these 250 references that the Galaxy project provides, totaling about six terabytes of data. So, this has been working great, it works great, but we thought, well, let's look at some alternatives. Uh, let's look at how can this uh, evolve, um, given that uh, we've encountered a couple of uh, sort of Drawbacks with it, perhaps, uh, um, 
And so one of them uh, has been this uh, notion that it's centrally managed and it's transaction based. So every time a change needs to be made, there's one person that can do it. He's in this room. Um, and so that made the community contributions uh, kind of challenging. The second thing is that uh, we as a project have to provide this locally replicated uh, hardware and maintain the service. And, and lastly, for somebody new coming into the Galaxy environment as a sysad and particularly CDM press is not kind of the, the, the average uh, uh, toolbox. Um, so they have to learn some new stuff. And so with uh, with that in mind, we, we uh, went to uh, to Amazon um, and looked at the uh, registry of open data that uh, that they offered us. So this is a uh, repository of uh, 300 high value data sets uh, from various domains. Um, and the data is hosted by Amazon um, for free, uh, including the egress, uh, egress data. So we applied and were uh, uh, accepted into this program, uh, meaning that the Galaxy reference data is now considered one of these uh, high value data sets by, uh, by Amazon's standards. And so what we do with that is uh, we take the contents of the CDMFS and we mirror it into an S3 bucket, namely the uh, um, uh, uh, open data repository for Galaxy. And from there, from now on, anybody um, is uh, uh, can consume the same Galaxy server, can configure it, and everything that you get off CUFS, you can alternatively get off of uh, from the S3 uh, bucket. And so, like I said, we, we kind of encountered some of these challenges with the CUFS only solution. So, uh, um, this is an, 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 another resource, it's a mirror of a resource. Uh, with the intent of solving uh, these three particular topics that I'm going to go into uh, in turn. So first one is this uh, notion of repository expansion, right? We've been talking about the uh, uh, community contributions to the Galaxy's uh, reference data repository for years, um, and, and this is something that can hopefully help. So S3 is a common uh, a tool in many sysadmins uh, toolboxes. And so it lowers that bar, uh, the contribution bar, because you upload a file to a bucket and, and it's there consumable, uh, you know, in addition to being configured with Galaxy. And, uh, but, but what it really also helps is that it opens possibilities where you, you can consume the public data that the project offers along with additional data that exists in other buckets. Because once Galaxy is able to consume data from a bucket, um, it, it can consume data from any number of, uh, of buckets. This also works for private data uh, that uh, an institution may want to um, may want to offer. Secondly, um, it doesn't have to be only Galaxy's reference data that is housed in this uh, repository. Uh, it can include other things other than map indices that, which is what we've done uh, uh, a lot of times. It can include annotation files, uh, sort of in a similar domain, uh, but it can also include data from other projects. So, by conductor. Um, a project that offers uh, packages and, and data for the R environment uh, joined us in, in this project uh, and they have deposited uh, compiled R software and libraries um, totaling about seven terabytes of data at, at, at this point. And so from an R session, you can install this uh, annotation hub package, for example, and browse the annotation hub data, um, and which comes from AWS, even though the, as a user, you don't really even see it, you just benefit some of the, the scalability uh, advantages that S3 offers. And I'll mention that in the Galaxy context in a second. Uh, the second thing is this uh, kind of increasing the accessibility of the file system uh, of, of the repository and data that, that goes within it. So uh, we registered the domain open by data.org you can go to, and, and it's a client-based um, uh, um, browser that, that allows you to browse uh, data that's in this repository. So again, uh, at this point, it, it has a, some data for Galaxy, some data for Bioconductor, so you can see what's there. You can just uh, uh, download it or at least uh, see what's, what's available. Um, and, and the last thing is uh, you know, relying on S3's um, scalability. So we've done some benchmarking um, and, and just to see how uh, uh, how the jobs perform. So uh, we set up two Galaxy instances, one in, uh, they're both on, G on the Google Cloud platform. One was CDMFS based installation, one was S3 uh, back installation for indices. Uh, the jobs, granted, ran only about five minutes or so, but uh, uh, the even though so this data is actually posted in, in uh, Pacific, whatever in, in Sydney, uh, and we still saw noticeable benefit in, in fetching data from um, from S3 as opposed to uh, from our uh, hosted CDMFS, which means there's no bottom uh, bottleneck bandwidth, and ultimately we have no storage infrastructure to maintain uh, as a project. And, and, and 
principle, we can also draw those references. And so, um, kind of in summary, I guess uh, the idea behind this project is to explore a, an evolution of how Galaxy reference data uh, can be provided to the broader community. Uh, Galaxy Bioconductor have uh, joined in this case to provide uh, some data. Same principles can be used to house and, and offer and, and consume data in private buckets. Um, the data is available today between an S3FS client. You can book it you know, to a Galaxy instance. You can also use common commands like wget and curl uh, to fetch individual files. Um, and, and there are downstream applications. So today you can do this from our studio. Um, and in the future, maybe you can add uh, uh, other APIs for other workflow engines. And uh, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, the people that uh, I work with on this project closely and uh, with the, uh, the organizations that made it possible. So thank you. Hey, awesome. Okay, next up, uh, Defying Gravity, a uh, painless process management for Galaxy servers by Nate Clare. Okay, thank you. Um, so a real quick history lesson on how you run a Galaxy server. Uh, uh, 15 years ago, it looked like this. You would run a number of Python processes that ran as paste server. Uh, which is a Python based uh, application server uh, and WSGI interface. And uh, it was, it, so to load balance, add more processes, you would just run more of these commands, uh, which was uh, not the, the easiest thing to do, but at least you know you just run this one, one server uh, in uh, lots of different uh, with, with different server names and, and you get lots of servers. So we can make this relatively easy with the from.sh script that you're probably familiar with with running Galaxy, uh, but lots of limitations there. Uh, so mid 2010s, uh, we, we started to move towards UWSGI, uh, which is if you've run Galaxy up until 2205, this is the server um, that, that has been running your Galaxy system. Um, uh, so the, the nice thing that we got with UWSGI, lots of things, but one of the nice things was that it uh, essentially acted as our process manager. So um, before web processes, it would fork off a number of uh, additional workers, it would route requests to them itself internally, um, and then we used this feature in UWSGI called Mules to run the processes that handle your jobs in Galaxy. Um, and, and so this is one entry point. Instead of uh, before we had to run these multiple paste commands, now you just run UWSGI uh, and it, it fires them up all the processes that are needed. But okay, now it's 2022. We want more features than what, what we can get with UWSGI. We want to use cool web technologies, asynchronous requests, uploads, uh, proxy for Galaxy interactive tools, and so forth. And plus, there were some features. Um, so you can do zero downtime restarts with UWSGI so that you know, your users don't notice when you restart your Galaxy server. And then we also had this ability to start the job handlers from UWSGI, which could use both of those at the same time. Um, and so now in Galaxy 2205, you've got all these different processes that run. So UWSGI is gone, you've got a unicorn, um, where, where it's just, uh, running certain tasks with celery, uh, your job handlers now run as this just independent um, Python, you know, main uh, We've got Tusty for uploads and the, the node proxy for, for interactive tools. That's a lot to manage. And we lost our sort of free process management that we had with each job. So what are we going to do? Uh, we, we now have gravity. Uh, this is essentially a, a little wrapper around supervisor. So in addition to controlling supervisor D, it writes and manages the config files for Super Classic E40. Um, it's also uh, a project that, that uh, I started working on in 2015, and then when UWSGI rolled around um, as our sort of solution of choice, I stopped working on that. But it was pretty much done, very close to done. Um, and it is included now with, uh, with uh, Galaxy 2205. So when you run run.sh, you run gravity to start uh, Galaxy. So why did we pick Supervisor D? Uh, if you are a Galaxy admin, um, you probably are familiar with it already. Um, so many, many Galaxy admins have been using this 
uh, uh, daemon for a long time to run their Galaxy servers. Uh, so how do you start and run Galaxy using Gravity? So uh, you can, of course, still run use run SH. This is like the development way to, to start running a Galaxy server. But now when you install your virtual environment with Galaxy, you also get this command, Galaxy. You just type Galaxy, run, it starts up. You can see it starts the, all the necessary processes. So G Unicorn and Celery, Celery B. Um, how do you run it uh, in the background as a daemon? There's also a separate command. So Galaxy is just sort of a front end to running a foreground Galaxy process. But there's this uh, a bigger utility called Galaxy Control um, that it, it familiar uh, to people who have used Supervisor in the past. You can see that there's a Galaxy Control start. This starts the processes and then detaches. Um, tells you where the log files are, so you can go look at all of the logs of the processes as they run. Uh, there is a status command that just sort of falls through this supervisor, as you can see. Uh, tells you what the processes are, uh, and then um, there's a stop to, to shut all of it down. Um, and then one thing, I didn't put it on this slide, uh, but uh, now you can see here, okay, we have three processes, just the genome corn, celery, and celery. But in a production galaxy server, you run separate job handlers um, as separate processes. And to do that, uh, there's a new gravity section of the uh, galaxy.yaml. It's documented in the sample. You can check it out. Um, and you can configure handlers to run there. And then all you do is run galaxy control update. And uh, you can see it starts up and runs those processes. Um, you can now also do zero downtime restarts, just like you could with USB third mode. This is thanks to a separate piece of software called Unicorn Herder uh, that herds G Unicorn processes, but it is uh, integrated with uh, Gravity. So you uh, change your application server from, from G Unicorn to Unicorn Herder run update, Galaxy Control update, and then everything just happens. Now you've got a, uh, a unicorn herd process running, and you can run Galaxy Control Graceful. Um, and that will, as you can see, it signals unicorn herder to restart. Uh, but then um, it only restarts the, uh, uh, the processes that, that it doesn't matter if they restart. Celery, Celery, B, you can restart those. But unicorn herder stayed running, just got a signal. Uh, got lots of stuff that we need to do uh, still. Um, some system, some enhancements for people who are using system D. Um, and I have a demo tomorrow. Uh, come check it out. I'll show you everything about how it works. Thanks. All right, moving on. Uh, Nuan Minasekara and uh, Catherine Bromhan are going to introduce meta scheduling Dallas jobs total percentage over Go for it. So, uh, we're going to talk about total perspective logic, which we like to call TPD for short, uh, which is just a little I think, because we might lose half a day pronouncing the name. Uh, so um, it's basically a dynamic job rule for Galaxy uh, for routing jobs to their appropriate destinations with appropriate settings. Um, so uh, I'm going to give you an overview of it, and then Catherine will follow up with some real world examples of how PPD would work in practice. Um, so the basic problem we're trying to solve is when you when you route jobs, Galaxy jobs to destinations. Uh, you might want to tweak settings that are in ways that are appropriate for your environment. So, for example, you might want to assign specific number of cores or memory for a job. You might want to route certain say, assembly jobs to a high memory node, and uh, and maybe you want to set specific environment variables. And quite often, we find ourselves repeatedly configuring these things across a large number of environments. So. Um, so there's been prior work to handle this, so as you probably are already familiar with, there are dynamic uh, job rules that Galaxy supports, which is a simple Python function that you can specify, and that Python function can uh, make these kinds of uh, decisions. Uh, of course, there are, so that's obviously hard to do, to have to write Python code for each thing you want to root. 
So uh, typically, there is the uh, Galaxy has built to support a company called Dynamic Two Definition, which you can figure, which is a which is a Python function, a Python job group. And that you configure using uh, a YAML file. Uh, so, uh, so there are variants of this. Use Galaxy U, use, use something called the sorting hat, and uh, use Galaxy.org uses the job router. But essentially, they're variants of the same idea uh, of using uh, a YAML file and using jobs. Uh, so, so we, with Galaxy Australia, we wanted to do something similar and we ran into some. Uh, problems that were unique to our environment as well. So we kind of realized that uh, we needed to have a more general purpose system that would be generalized and used by others as well. Uh, that could potentially, because we Galaxy Australia had a large number of pulsar nodes, we also wanted to be able to do a kind of meta scheduling so that all these pulsar nodes would be utilized more effectively. Uh, and we also wanted to reduce the amount of repetitive work we were collectively doing as uh, uh, amongst administrators of Galaxy instances, uh, see whether we could combine effort on this. So that those are kind of your overarching goals of TPD. So, so basically TPD is also a pluggable job rule uh, and it's an extensible mechanism for routing jobs. Uh, so uh, it comes as a PC installable package built included with Galaxy 2205, uh, or, or you could pip install it into all the versions. Uh, and, it, and it is in a similar way uh, configured through your job conf YAML. Um, so, so let's look at some of the key capabilities that um, TPD provides. So we're going to look at five basic capabilities. Uh, today, uh, but there's the documentation on our, on all its features uh, on, on in the docs. Uh, so basically, the first thing we're going to look at is how do you specify basic resource requirements for two. So again, it's a uh, it's configured through a YAML file, uh, and here we see up, up there uh, uh, a simple tool definition for a bow tie tool. And you can see if you specify the number of cores and memory that you should assign to that job. And you can also list the destinations in that same YAML file that are available in your environment. So uh, straight off the bat, you might notice that uh, we've assigned six cores and memory is an expression of cores. So it's actually a Python expression. And in fact, all TPD fields are Python expressions. So they're evaluated at runtime and you can have complex uh, multi-line uh, Python code, if you so wish, but quite often they're just constants. Um, and then the destinations are whatever is available in your environment, and then TPD will automatically find the best matching, uh, fitting destination for your job. So that's that's the basic thing. So next, uh, what, what if you have more complex routing requirements, like you want to send high main jobs to a high memory node and so on? So the way TPD allows this is through tags. So you, it matches up tags on your on your tools and your destinations, and you can you can express preference or aversion to a particular destinations to this tagging system. So there's more on the documentation, but basically, uh, so in, in this particular example, we express a preference for high memory nodes and we reject offline nodes. Uh, but in this particular case, in the destination. Uh, there's only one destination that matches, and that's the slurm destination down below. Um, so, so using this tag based system, we can uh, also do uh, meta scheduling. So, again, uh, when, you, when you have a whole network of pulsar servers, we could uh, uh, balance that, uh, balance those jobs across multiple servers, and uh, TPE can basically query the status of each server and uh, allow you to rank the least loaded destination and group jobs there. So again, it's, it's an extensible pluggable function that you can add uh, and your own code into TPD. So the next thing we're going to look at is how do you conditionally adjust jobs, uh, job requirements based on input parameters. So here, uh, we see here this uh, TPD provides an if condition. So you can conditionally uh, make decisions and adjust resources accordingly. So here you notice that it's a simple Python expression again. Again, it's input size greater than 10, adjust the cores to 8 and memory to 32. 
Uh, and so you can you can use uh, these embedded Python expressions. You can add scheduling tags conditionally, or you can also gracefully fail with the user friendly error message. Uh, so next, we're going to look at uh, how do you reduce the repetitiveness of configuration. Uh, so here we have one tool, and uh, that tool is inherited by another. Uh, so uh, it's a very simple mechanism. So you can just inherit a tool and override the settings you you pick up. Uh, and the nice thing about this is that when you override it, you see that code is 16, but men that you in, which you inherit is actually an expression. So that's evaluated in a delayed fashion, so you get uh, 16 into 4 fair memory. Okay, so um, the last thing we're going to look at is how do you further reduce this repetition? Uh, so for that, we're going to, uh, so TPD supports loading rules from a remote HTTP URL, for example. So you could have a whole bunch of rules and you can load multiple rules files, all to your, you can just specify it in a job comp. And uh, the advantage here is that you could potentially centralize all these rules and share them amongst the community so that we don't all have to rediscover these, okay, how many calls should you use for a high set job or how much memory should you assign for it? We can, we can contribute our experiences back to this shared database. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Catherine, who's going to talk about TPD in real world uh, and applied in a real world setting. So um, Simon and Milan started developing the Total Perspective Vortex mid last year, and we deployed it on Galaxy Australia in November. And so the biggest change is that instead of mapping a tool to an individual destination, we are mapping a tool to a set of destination characteristics. And for each tool, we now have more destinations where the tool is allowed to run. And this is a much better utilization of our resources. It's led to lower queue times and far less admin overhead. Uh, this is a graph of the load on two of our pulsar nodes over 24 hour periods, one week apart. The first one is before the TPV was deployed and the second one is after. And because the TPV is using feedback um, from um, the uh, load of the pulsars, the second graph, the loads track together fairly well. So um, the TPV is preferentially scheduling jobs to nodes that are more available. And um, for the configuration, we have um, all of our tools in a YAML file, starting with the default tool. The default tool is what we've defined um, for all of the other tools to inherit their values from. So the default tool runs with one core. Its mem is an expression. Uh, it's four times the number of cores in gigabytes. And because all of our jobs are running on Slurm, we've defined a native specification parameter, which is substituting values for cores, mem, and the Slurm partition, which we've defined to be main for the default tool, but this might be overridden for other tools. The only scheduling rule for the default tool is that it can't run on any destination that's marked as offline. So to set a destination to offline, in this um, configuration, we have Pulsar A and Pulsar B. Pulsar B has been set to offline by just adding the offline tag. And the configuration changes take effect immediately. If you need to take a note down for maintenance, you can just set it, set it to offline and jobs will no longer be scheduled there. Um, another tool example is Picard. We've defined a rule that matches all of the tool wrappers in the PCAD repository. So that's about 30 wrappers. And in this case, we don't need to explicitly set the mem value because that's inherited it from the default tool. So the mem is just the number of cores times four. We can also put an environment variable in here that's using the mem value. 
Another example is AlphaFold. Um, in this case, we've explicitly set the MEM to be 106 gig. This is also used in the GPU. It's running in a Docker container and we can set the Docker parameters for the tool. Um, it also has a funny scheduling rule because we only allow people in a particular group to use it. So the scheduling rule in this case is checking for non-membership of the alpha fold group. And if this evaluates to true, it fails with a user-friendly customer message. Uh, sometimes we might want to um, give tools particular resources based on what the user has put in the tool form. So for example, Kema abundance distribution, um, the user has selected large animal genome as a sample type. And in this case, we know that they need far more memory. And this emphasizes the importance of um, having a shared resource um, of scheduling needs for galaxy tools. And there's a birds of a feather session tomorrow afternoon uh, for building a global database of tool resource requirements. And thank you to everybody involved um, and Galaxy Australia. And I know we're skipping questions, but ask us anything anytime about this. Great job. I'm sorry, everyone. I kind of messed up your time. Okay. <laughs> All right. We've got one more talk before lunch. Uh, I'm going to introduce Reed Wagner. He's going to talk about the brand. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, for some reason, the, the name Brett is very popular. People always. <laughs> but, okay, I'll take us home. Um, so before I start, um, I just want to uh, give a special acknowledgement to JJ because he's actually done the bulk of the implementation. Um, and so I think he said he'd buy me two beers if I uh, presented. So, um, yeah, so I'm presenting on it. Uh, but yeah, I'll be talking about our implementation of a wrapper for uh, FragPipe. Uh, so, FragPipe um, is an orchestrated software suite for spec, uh, spec mass spec based uh, proteomics analysis. Um, and so it incorporates like a whole host of uh, software, as you can see, but the main uh, powering tool is MS Fragger, which uh, is a proteomic search tool. And it was actually, I think, presented on in depth uh, at last year's PCC. Um, so it's maintained by Alexei uh, Fiskis lab at the University of Michigan, and in particular, uh, Dr. Feng Chao uh, Yu, who's uh, attending GCC today. Um, and he'll be giving a talk uh, sort of in more in depth on FragPipe. Uh, tomorrow. So FragPipe was originally a Java GUI based, um, but um, since last year, a headless mode was added actually um, so that it can be used in, in Galaxy and similar sort of uh, use cases. So I'm not going to focus too much on the technical uh, details of FragPipe um, or the science um, and more so just on our implementation in Galaxy. Um, so this is uh, this is FragPipe. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and I show it to sort of point out that it's highly configurable. Um, and uh, for us, what that means is because the, uh, you know, um, the headless FragPipe uh, works mostly the same as the original application, uh, our work is uh, primarily in the tool XML file um, and basically recreating this GUI in Galaxy. Um, and because it's so configurable, it's given us some sort of interesting um, challenges to recreate. Um, so this is what it uh, looks like now. Our work is basically converting from this to this. Uh, so the first uh, kind of feature I want to point out um, that was interesting uh, is one of the first inputs, which are the LC MS files. Um, so uh, you can see uh, we've got four of these. Um, and some FragPipe analyses, um, it's important to be able to group these files by the experiment that they came from. Um, so in this Java interface, um, there's a few different ways to do that. You can click into these columns uh, and sort of manually set it. There's a few options to sort of automatically set it. Um, so the question for us was, how do we recreate this in Galaxy? Because we, there, there just isn't this exact same way of 
uh, sort of assigning this metadata or this grouping to input files. Um, so this is what we came up with in Galaxy. Um, so you can see uh, sort of analogous to these two groups, there's a uh, in the experiment column there. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is basically create uh, an input, a separate input section, file input section for each uh, of these groups. Um, so instead of having one list where you assign this metadata, uh, we create like a new entry for, for each grouping. Um, and the way we do this uh, is, oh, well, uh, you know, this is, this is a somewhat common uh, sort of Galaxy interface, like putting an input, um, but we're able to create sort of an arbitrary number of groups with this interesting tag called the repeat tag. Um, and so what the repeat tag allows you to do uh, is basically take um, any sort of parameter XML that you have um, and the user, uh, it will automatically generate this button and the user can simply add an arbitrary uh, number of uh, repetitions of this input. Um, so in this case, we had two groups, but we could add more. Um, and so you can see how that could be useful for all sorts of uh, use cases. So moving on, um, yeah, Headless Ragpipe uses uh, a configuration file, which is you know not an uncommon way to configure it, configure uh, an application that has so many options um, as opposed to like command line options or something like that. Um, so yeah, so you know a user might ask, well, how do you, how can we do this easily in Galaxy? Um, and also, how can we incorporate default settings, which are a feature of uh, right type. Um, so the config file tag is really useful for this. Um, so what this does is it basically allows you to write a block of templating code um, and that template uh, or that code, once it's evaluated, is written directly to a file, which can then be referenced um, when you're invoking uh, the uh, application. So here you can see on the left, um, this is just a very abbreviated uh, snippet of our config file definition. Um, and you know, there's kind of a lot there. So, but it, it boils down to this in the end. Um, and uh, you can see on the right, that's a, an abbreviated part of our command uh, element where we uh, reference the config file with that sort of workflow config file uh, variable. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that. Uh, yeah, so like uh, Fragbyte comes with a, a set of sort of predefined uh, workflows, like pre predefined like for different types of searches, uh, open, uh, you know, pose non specific HLA, et cetera. Um, and so we wanted to be able to like just sort of uh, hit the ground running and, and run this without having recreated all of them. And we also don't necessarily need the user to input like uh, every single parameter or, or go over every single parameter. And so what we were able to do is um, Either a history can be, or a workflow can be input by the user history, or uh, you know we have defaults that are stored in the file system that are provided by Fragpipe. And uh, in this code block, you can see that we actually, depending on whichever one, we'll read that in, and then we basically create a dictionary of all the options. And then in the rest of the tool XML file, when we're setting parameters, we use that same dictionary and we overwrite those values. Uh, and then at the very end, we have a loop, um, and we write out every single. Key value. Um, so uh, yeah, so so that's how we kind of uh, tackle that problem. Um, we've got a lot of uh, work still to do on this, um, and we will be working on it a lot at CodeFest. So anyone who's interested, uh, please definitely uh, stop by. You can ask questions, help us, um, give us ideas, uh, and we're also uh, we've also implemented uh, BioCounter recipes for um, MS Rag and Crack Pipe. So those are on GitHub as well if you want to check them out. Thanks. Right. So I think it would be a good idea if the speakers for this session could maybe like pick a table and field questions in like kind of one location. So sit at different tables. And if you're looking for a QA, find your table with your speaker's interest. All right. Let's give one more round of applause for Chris Peterson.